The Unshackled Waves, episode 224. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to our first show since the horrific Twin Mosque shootings in Christchurch, New Zealand on Friday afternoon. Uh, 50 people have been confirmed murdered by 28-year-old Australian-born white nationalist Brenton Tarrant. The consequences of this terrorist attack, as is the case with any other terror attack in the West, regardless of who is the perpetrator, is the erosion of our freedoms and liberties. New hate speech laws, mass surveillance and gun control are high on big government and big brother's agenda. All made the major political parties, including conservative ones, have indicated they will no longer tolerate criticism and critiques of Islam. This horrific event has given the totalitarians both on the left and the right the perfect excuse to implement the controls over our society they have always dreamed of. I'll be discussing the shooting, the killer's motive, and what it means for the future of both Australia and New Zealand with senior editor of The Unshackled, Damien Ferry, in a moment. But first, I want to comment on the reactions to the mass shootings from mainstream conservative and libertarian figures. Now, the context of this being the side story that has developed due to Senator Fraser Anning's statement of the shooting where he said it was a consequence of mass Muslim immigration to the West and was a form of blowback against Muslims for the violence they have perpetrated in Western countries. Now he has been condemned by Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who called his comments disgusting, appalling, ugly, while Bill Shorten said he was a fool. Labor's Tony Burke called them hate speech. There will now be a bipartisan censure motion against Anning when Parliament resumes in April. Online, I've seen prominent uh, political figures call Anning a grub, dickhead, and an arsehole, who is the worst politician we've ever had in Parliament and should be put last at the next election. Now. I didn't agree with Anning's statement. Yes, a clash of civilizations is taking place in the West and unfettered immigration isn't helping, but that never gives anyone the right to murder innocents and it should not be rationalized as a consequence of this at all. But the pylon against Anning in repeated gratuitous acts of virtue signaling by those who say they believe in free speech and during a time when freedoms need to be safeguarded like never before has been disgusting to view. And we saw the consequences of such vitriol yesterday at Anning's Conservative National Party meeting in Melbourne where a 17-year-old high school student, Will Conley, thought it was appropriate to crack an egg on the back of Anning's head while he was giving a press conference. Anning then slapped him back twice and the boy was restrained by Anning's supporters until eventually police arrived, too late in my opinion to physically remove Conley. Now Conley is being celebrated by the left as a hero for assaulting a senator, even by Anning's fellow Senator Greens, uh, Sarah Hansen Young. Egg and Nazi was trending on Twitter uh, the other night, and the fact that there are now calls, believe it or not, to prosecute Anning for slapping the boy back and his supporters for using excessive force, never mind the fact that if this egging had never taken place in the first place, then this wouldn't have happened. Now, I've seen conservatives and libertarians somehow justify a unprovoked attack on somebody and saying it is wrong to act in self-defense. It's pretty much you're throwing all your principles out the window, and if you think somebody's words justify an act of violence, you've basically adopted the left's mantra of punch a Nazi. Conservatives and libertarians need to understand that the left isn't going to like you for condemning Anning. Conservatives and libertarians need to understand that the left isn't going to like you for condemning Anning, nationalism, and now supporting Islam. Sky News and News Corp are still being blamed by the media for creating the climate for the shooting with groups such as Sleeping Giants Oz still targeting advertisers of those companies. You are still the enemy of the left. And if you fail to defend freedom now for nationalists, you'll soon find your freedom will go next. When we're living in a police state and your children ask, what did you do to stop this? Or what are you going to say to them that I was too busy saying that it's okay to egg Nazis? 
The Unshackled, as we set out in our mission from the very beginning, will defend freedom and liberty during this uncertain time, with all the major political parties set to adopt more totalitarian policies. A free society has never been in a more precarious position. That's my promise going forward. Now let's bring in Damien Ferry. Damien, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Uh, it's been a while and, well, there's certainly a lot to catch up uh, given the events in Christchurch uh, this weekend with uh, the horrific Twin Mosque uh, massacre. We'll start by looking at the, the, the shooter himself, a 28-year-old uh, Australian-born uh, Brenton Tarrant. Now, he live-streamed the attacks to Facebook. Uh, social networks have attempted to delete as many of the, the re-uploads that have uh, popped up the killer's uh, background. Now, uh, Brenton Tarrant, he, he grew up in Grafton in nor northern New South Wales. He was originally a, a personal trainer. His father died uh, early at the age of 49, so he used the inheritance he got, and he also made money from uh, Bitcoin in the early days. So he traveled yeah. the world, even to uh, places uh, such as Pakistan, which he actually said he quite liked there, and even to North Korea. And it's it's interesting that it's actually a pattern of these type of killers to go on these expeditions. It reminded me of Lee Harvey Oswald's adventures before he mm. assassinated uh, John F. Kennedy. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, it would be too, too uh, early to call it a midlife crisis as such, because, I mean, this guy's only still fairly young. Um, but in saying that, it's it's very odd. A lot of people are making comments on social media that um, why would he be going to places like Pakistan and um, North Korea? And um, in his um, manifesto or um, the comments that he's actually established is that he's not really consistent in his ideology at all. I mean, he's um, in the past called himself a communist, then he was an anarchist. Um, now he's called he called himself an eco-fascist. So I mean, yeah. he doesn't really he doesn't really have a um, a strong consistency there, and um, that's why when um, when you have the politicians, especially you know ones that are supposed to be on the right, calling him um, right wing extremists, well, what exactly makes him right wing? Um, a lot of people actually said that. Um, when they have read his manifesto, that he sounds more like a, a left-wing nationalist. Uh, right? I, I disagree with that. I mean, he calls himself an ethno-nationalist, a eco-fascist, and if you actually look up the philosophy of fascism, it does preach environmental uh, conservation. For example, the, the Nazis were about environmental uh, con uh, conservation. So I think mm. it is fair to say that he was a, a nationalist. Now, being a nationalist doesn't fit into the, the left-right thing. So this is why conservatives yeah. have tried to say he wasn't right-wing. I mean, look at, he admired communist China and that, but this... Uh, yeah, that's, the, well, that's, that's the, correct. The, I mean, yeah. This guy did it in the, the name of nationalism. He said he wanted to hurt what he uh, called the invaders, uh, stop whites being uh, ethnically replaced. And it, it is pretty much, if you read the manifesto, it, it, it reads explicitly as all the views that a white nationalist holds which of course is especially damaging to not just white nationalists in particular but the broader nationalist movement. Yeah, I, I think one weird thing that um, needs to be brought up is he grew up in Grafton. Um, why did he choose New Zealand as a uh, location to um, commit this crime and not in his uh, either home area or um, in you know New South Wales or Australia? It, um, and you know, it, it just you know to go into New Zealand and be doing it. Um, well, it he said he he did it there because he wanted to show that no place was safe. Everyone thinks mm -hmm. that New Zealand is this sleepy part of the earth where everything's peaceful and harmonious. And so his justification was that I want to show that you know nowhere is safe. I mean, Christchurch is mm -hmm. uh, the the main city of the South Island, tucked away there where not many people live. It's 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 quite a insignificant part of New Zealand. That is correct. I mean, it hasn't um, faced anything like this before. Um, but yeah, I, I just I just thought um, you know why he specifically chose New Zealand and um, and not even maybe committed a crime when he was overseas in these sort of countries. Um, I mean, 
you know, he could use that as a, as a reasoning for sure. No problem. Um, I, I just, um, it's obviously something worth questioning. Well, he acted completely alone, and this is why he evaded mm. the authorities. There, there were reports today that apparently the, the New Zealand government was sent the manifesto a few days in advance and didn't act. Um, I'm not sure about uh. the... Uh, whether that's 100% uh, verified, but he had no association to any local nationalist groups. I know that uh, the mainstream media on Friday were bring, uh, ringing up Blair Cottrell, Neil Erickson, Sherman Burgess to ask him about this person. Nobody knew uh, who he was. They'd never never seen him. And he was a, a gamer. And so when you're a gamer, you tend to exist only online i mean yeah. and and this is uh, another thing that people are trying to uh tar that uh, violent video games need to be mm. uh, controlled in the in in the in the wake of this so yeah he he wasn't part of any nationalist group nor did he say he was in his manifesto uh, he said he was inspired by brevik the the norwegian uh, mass uh, murderer, and he said that his biggest uh, inspiration was uh, Oswald Mosley, who was yeah. the uh, British Union of uh, Fascists uh, leader. He has a few Mosley quotes in that, uh, mm. so he he doesn't really tar any sort of mainstream nationalist group with this, well, except for uh, Candace Owens, that's sort of there. And uh, in the video, of course, he mentioned uh, PewDiePie, who is yeah. he, he was called a, he's a gamer and he's called a gateway to the alt-right. Well, it doesn't surprise me of, um, of the Mosley connection because he's uh, British of origin. So obviously, um, if he's uh, looking at um, ethnicity and ethno-nationalism, he's going to be looking at where his roots are, um, where, where they come from. So he'll be following that. Um, gaming, um, I think the nationalists uh, or the nationalist movement in America is um, more into the whole gaming scene. I don't think it's very big over here in Australia. I think the people that are nationalists here aren't really into that sort of um, um, it, in the realm of, of gaming and gaining their sort of following and and, um, and producing their views and everything like that. So I think that's more of an American than overseas based thing. Now let's move on to what have been the the consequences post uh, the the mosque massacres. Well, first thing is is that New Zealand is set to ad adopt Australia style gun laws because the the guns that we use he was able to use uh tweak a semi-automatic weapon to make it a automatic uh, weapon uh contrary to what a lot of people believe new zealand has uh more uh lax gun laws you are allowed to get uh, semi-automatic weapons there and jacinda ardern has said that uh, our gun laws will change and um, I, I would say that uh, she she'll probably make it happen uh after after this um, New Zealand, there, there hasn't really been any appetite for strict Australia-style gun laws in the, in the past uh, 20 years, but uh, if uh, history has shown if that the, the major parties get together, like happened in Australia in 1996, then uh, that's what will happen. Bipartisanship is pretty much the, the death of uh, democracy. Yep. Um, I mean, and the funny thing about this all is that we were all expecting this to happen. I mean, it wasn't something that, and I mean, it, it, it kind of goes to show that um, after what happened in Port Arthur, that as soon as this event took place, that people were already calling it that this was going to happen and that gun control was going to come in. I mean, it's, um, it, it's just nuts that they, they think that they can, you know, all of a sudden surprise everybody with, oh, you know, we have to do this. I mean, this was to be expected. There, there's definitely, the, the motto of governments is never let a crisis go to waste. And so when something mm, like this mm. does happen, they see it as an opportunity. Now's our chance. Now, Jacinda Ardern, she's from the, the Labour Party in New Zealand. Uh, however, she is in coalition with uh, New Zealand First, the, the Nationalist uh, Party. And so, and the, the National Party, which is the, the equivalent of the, the Liberal Party uh, in New Zealand, if those three parties and, well, the Greens are going to support it anyway, pretty much if all the four parties get together and say, we'll have gun control, then 
that's what's going to happen. And it's interesting also in Australia as well, we've pretty much seen uh, One Nation, which was actually born uh, partly out of anger with uh, the gun control measures that were put in place in, in 1996 after Port Arthur. Uh, Mark Latham, their New South Wales lead Senate candidate, and who has always been a strong supporter of gun control, has, basic, has come out on Twitter this morning and said, uh, well done on uh, Jacinda Ardern uh, introducing Australia-style gun laws for New Zealand. Uh, One Nation New South Wales fully supports this. Yeah, it's very sad to see, and a lot of people are going to drive away from them because of it. I mean, um, over the last couple of months, actually, One Nation has lost a lot of following um, over multiple uh, reasons that we can um, discuss another time. But, I mean, when, when, he, when he comes out and, um, and says this, this isn't what his following would expect him to say. I mean, he, they, they expect him to represent them, uh, which is normally a regional, rural sort of voter, uh, people that would generally be, you know, um, pro-gun and they're not, not gun control at all. So um, he's definitely not doing himself any favours, especially that he's got an election coming up um, very, very soon. Um, I think a lot of voters might um, switch their support to the shooters, fishers and farmers rather than One Nation because of something like this, especially people that are uh, um, registered firearm. Yeah, um, and the uh, Liberal personnel. Democrats as well with David Linehan yeah. as the lead candidate. Yeah, that's it. I mean, uh, One Nation could have really um, done well this election, but this didn't do him any favours. I mean... What, what voters was he supposed to win out of this in, in announcing something like this? I mean, this is why a lot of people um, really start to focus on, um, on branching out too much rather than taking care of their base. And by doing that, they just end up ruining themselves. It's, um, it's really sad to see. And I mean, um, like we'll mention um, further down the line is that this event has really, um, apart from the gun control issue, but it will further restrict freedom of speech and it will further um, give ammo for the left, especially to attack um, the whole narrative of um, white privilege and um, continue to, to put their hate out there. And th this is not what people like me and you or our listeners want. I mean, this goes directly um, against our beliefs and our, and our values. So when people like to say, oh, you know, this guy had your ideology. No, he didn't, because what he actually did, apart from it being such a massacre and a disgusting event, what he actually did, it, what it ended up as a consequence, worked out to be counterproductive and went against us. Yeah, you, know? you believe the whole helter-skelter Charles Manson thing, that his mm. uh, massacring of innocents would somehow start, he wanted to start a ra uh, race a war in the the United States for for whites to to take over again. That was the the idea of uh, idea of that. And no, that, yeah. that's that's not going to happen at all. After no. every terror attack, no matter as as I've said uh, in in print, and I'll say again now, after every terror attack, no matter who the perpetrator is, uh, erosions of freedom and liberties follow. That's right. And what really really angers me is that in this country especially, we were really getting somewhere and we were able to get our narrative across to even what you would say are normies. Um, people were really getting on board with the, um, the immigration issue, uh, the Sudanese crime problems and all the rest of it. And he, in one simple act, has basically screwed everything up and made everything go down to the drawing board now. I mean, th this is what has resulted from this. I mean. You know, things were going a certain way where the country was shifting and now it's just flipped again and given the left the narrative now again. Um, I mean, it's, it's just a disgusting thing to, to occur. I mean, it's, um, it's harmed us in every way possible. I mean, and obviously done um, a, a, a bad uh, thing for the country of New Zealand, um, for the people that are going to be facing the consequences of these actions now. And also um, that now there could be, um, you know, what you could say are um, retaliations. You know, this is something here as well that we have to think of. So does that mean yeah. now that... Uh, Thankfully, there, yeah. there hasn't been any Muslim retaliations uh, yet. There, there were some photos circulating online with a... a 
assault, assault looking rifle. I know I shouldn't use that word, firearm people will get mad at me, but with all Arabic writing on it and saying revenge is, is coming, but thankfully there hasn't been any uh, retaliation yet. Well, well that, that, that is a good thing at this stage, but we just don't know what lays down the track and these kind of things don't help. I mean, it causes division and this is something that, you know, people in power, the elites and whatever you want to call them love because it, can, it causes friction and division in the community. And this is where they can come in, strip your freedoms away, you know, go ahead with a police state if that's what they choose to do down the line. I mean, this is exactly, it works for them, you know. I mean, you know, on the day when it all happens, they can, you know, have a little sort of, you know, a sooky face and, you know, say we stand by with solidarity and all the rest of it. But at the end of the day, you know, in the background, this works to their agenda. You know, it's stripping us of freedoms. Yeah. It, um, you know, it's everything that us people are against. I mean, we want to be able to, um, you know, call our political correctness. We want to be able to sort of, um, you know, speak and, and have, you know, people come over and, and, you know, say what they feel and, and all the rest of it. But this kind of thing restricts everything now, and this is what we don't want. I mean, it, it's so counterproductive. It's, it's just... You know, angers me when people say, oh, yeah, but he has your ideology. You know, he's, you know, it, it, not only that, but anyone with nationalist views now, you know, the social media is going to try and shut you down. You know, there's going to be, you know, it's, it's just a terrible sort of future that we're seeing here right now. Well, we're definitely going to end up with a, uh, a speech police state. I mean, Scott Morrison mm -hmm. said after the attack, it was a uh, it was a terror attack by a violent right wing extremist. He didn't even say extreme right or far right. He said right wing, and he's supposed yeah. to be a right wing <laughs> person. And of course, he expressed solidarity with the the Muslim faith. And and Bill Shorten said that not all uh, hate speech leads to right wing violent extremism, but all right wing violent extremism begins with with hate speech. So we are definitely going to get uh, some form of hate speech laws. I mean, there's already some that have been passed in, in New South Wales. And the Religious Discrimination Act, uh, which was proposed by the, the Morrison government, now I opposed it when it came out. I know that there was a lot of uh, Christian people who thought that this will protect us in the age of same-sex marriage. No, it's going to be used as a weapon now to silence critics and critiques of Islam and create blasphemy laws. I mean, yeah, I... But well, one thing people have to understand, and I mean, I guess all our our listeners will know this just from experience now, that um, it's all the minority groups that are protected under the laws and, and people that are considered the majority um, aren't. And um, that, that's the thing. I mean, even though on paper it might sound like, oh, yeah, we're going to also, you know, um, sneakily, you know, um, get back at the minorities because they won't be able to criticise us anymore, but it doesn't really work that way because the, the law even though it may be in plain writing that um, it sounds like it's fair, in reality it just isn't. I mean, uh, it's always going to be used against you rather than, you know, for you. And that's why the, the laws aren't going to do anything to protect you at all. And there's probably going to be, if there wasn't already, in, increased social media policing. There's been a lot of left of ac activists who say that nationalist uh, Facebook pages and Twitter accounts should be shut down. I mean, this week we saw Blair Cottrell's Twitter account uh, deleted. Uh, he and Neil have already been banned from uh, Facebook. So it's already in motion. It's just going to uh, keep going. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's going to stop. I mean, um, it will come to a stage where people with even, you know, mildly centre-right views are going to be called extreme. And um, th this is the thing here. I mean, uh, you know, soon enough, you know, someone that's a green is going to be your, you know, your, your centre-right sort of candidate. And then um, people on the left would be some sort of, you know, really, you know, socialist alliance sort of, you know, that, that would be your centre left, actually. Um, and then people on the far left are just going to be, you know, really, you know, crazy sort of, you know, um, because everything's going to go that way. I mean, everything moves and shifts a certain way. And even though things were happening where it was starting to shift um, to the right, I think it's going to do a backflip now and things are going to go back because, I mean, at the end of the day, um, people can can see when things are shifting and when things are going against them, then these sort of things work to their advantage. I mean, even if um, there was no uh, false flag that happened and everything was a legit thing, I mean, it, they still use, um, like you said, Ardern and all the rest of them, they capitalise on these things. 
And this is the disgusting thing about it. Rather than just mourning about, you know, um, what had taken place, they actually used this as an advantage to put their ideology out there and to make changes. And I think that's wrong. Yeah, and Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton, the supposed two hard men of immigration, are now desperately trying to make up for their, their previous uh, comments uh, criticising uh, open immigration from Islamic parts of the world. But they're, they're still being blamed from, by the left for creating uh, the environment that led to uh, this attack. It's the same with uh, Sky News, with uh, Chris Kenny. He's been busily replying to uh, leftist on Twitter uh, uh, saying, oh, Sky News has never done this. This is a, a slur against me and the rest of the, the the network. And the leftist replies saying, well, this is, you know, you've got blood in your hands as well. You know, the left isn't suddenly going to forgive you. Uh, Greg Sheridan writing in The Australian, we are all Muslims now. That's not going to make the, the left like News Corp and Sky News. I mean, Sleeping Giants Oz is still going to get try and get all the ads taken off. I mean, you're not going to win them over. That's exactly right. Um, the way I've always talked to people about this is as soon as you start appeasing the left, they take advantage and they just drill you into the ground. I mean, um, if you are someone that um, stands up and is very principled and, you know, basically tells it as it is, the worst thing they can say is call you what you are. They can say, oh, okay, this person is bad because he has those views, but they can't say you're gutless. They can't stamp on you because you are being honest um, according to how you feel. And when this takes place, people see authenticity. I mean, there are some people on the left, for instance, that are so dedicated to their views that you could say, you know what, I disagree with them, but they are authentic. Whereas all of the people, say, in the Labor and the Liberal, the major parties, all the people that are basically around in the centre, um, don't hold many strong principles. They are there as career politicians. They don't have this, you know, um, drive that's making them into politics and wanting to make changes and do what's right. They're just there for, you know, the, the fame and fortune. And that's why people on the fringes, normally you can, you can look at them and say, you know what, whether I agree or disagree with them, I know that they're there because they believe in something. And you can't appease people and also have people think that you're authentic. As soon as you do that, you are finished. And we've seen this with groups um, within One Nation, within the Nationals, that every time they have tried to appease um, their enemies, their enemies have just stamped them and they have basically killed them. And I mean, this, this is something that, um, you know, people on the right have to understand. And of course, the the Morrison government now they've now rebanned uh, Milo Yiannopoulos from touring Australia. So Home Affairs uh, initially said that he was going to be denied a visa. Then that was overturned by David Coleman, the immigration minister, last week. Uh, so he was allowed in on free speech grounds. But uh, Scott Morrison gave a warning, saying, "Oh, you better respect our multicultural society, or else." But now they've done another backflip and re re banned him again because. Uh, he uh, commented on uh, Facebook uh, that uh, the, the the massacre was a, a consequence of Muslim immigration to the, the West. This, this is um, how liberal the Liberal Party is now, you know. I mean, it's, um, it's nothing, nothing better than, than the Labor Party. It's um, pretty much the same thing. And that's why people are turning to minor parties, because they're sick of the same old. I mean, Milo gets banned, then he gets granted permission to come, then he gets banned again. Um, you know, but, but at the same time, there's a lot of crazy, a lot of crazy extremists on the left and nobody raises a finger at them. I mean, they've got Marxist conferences every year. Yeah, Marxist calling for the violent overthrow of capitalism and praising yeah. murderers like uh, Che Guevara. And I mean, in saying that, I mean, a nationalist conference, if there ever was, one to exist because it's never allowed and always gets clamped down. But if there was one to exist, they don't go far into saying that they should overthrow the governments and stuff. They're basically preaching a patriotism, um, I would consider. I mean, like, they don't really go into extremes like people in Marxist conference would. Yet a Marxist conference gets, you know, posters put up everywhere. They get, you know, uh, permission to hold these uh, events. 
and you even have sometimes green members and whatnot go to them, which is not really a surprise, and nobody raises an eye to it. Why not? I mean, this is extremism. I would consider that extremism. I mean, it's more a lot more extreme than any one of, of, of the, the patriots are because the patriots really aren't really, um, you know, they're, they're just very, you know, patriots. They're not, they're not really like uh, far-right extremists like people make them out to be. And... Um, I think there's a big double standard there, you know. I think it, it's crazy that one one side of things are allowed to have um, their events and the others aren't. Um, and I think a lot of people are seeing that for what it is. And, you know, it just, it just doesn't make sense to me. Well, there's only been one politician who's been prepared to, to go against the, the flow on this and go against the, the, the media and uh, political narrative, and that's Senator Fraser Anning. He put out a, a statement on, on Friday night uh, saying that uh, this attack was a consequence of mass Muslim migration to the West, and it was a, a form of uh, blowback for all the, the terror attacks that Muslims had, had carried out in the, the West. Now, I didn't agree uh, with with that statement. Uh, I do think that a culture clash has happened between, uh, in this, uh, bringing in all these Muslim immigrants, but that never ever justifies killing innocents. That's, uh, that's ne never justified. Uh, but that was Fraser Anning's free speech right to do. But the, the 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 pile on and the the virtue signaling of people saying he's a disgusting uh, person and it just opened up a whole ra whole new round of uh, people using it to say look how moral I am I'm condemning this uh, evil uh, man. Yeah, I I um, read the the statement when it first was released and I actually um, also thought it was harsh um, considering um, having it been released just after 50 people or 49 people were, were killed. There, there was um, elements within there, like you mentioned, in regards to um, being a culture clash, in regards to um, uh, people that then, that it was only a matter of time that you would have somebody um, react in the opposite way as to what has been happening um, in the many years that have passed. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of accurate things in there. I, I just think that um, PR-wise, it could have been seen as um, not something that would really, um, I guess you could say, uh, win him support. But in saying that, uh, you mentioned that he did uh, increase his following um, since he, he yeah, had gone. his Facebook likes went up from, I think, around 93,000 on Friday, and now it's at 104,000. Wow. Wow. So that, 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 that maybe I was wrong. Maybe it did, it did increase his, uh, his following, I mean, by the looks of things. Um, so, yeah. I'm a, I mean, uh, well, what is interesting is um, also uh, the, the event with uh, the so-called Egg Boy, the yes, he, he, he was planning to have a Melbourne meeting of his uh, Fraser Anning's Conservative Nationals Party. It's not registered yet because obviously with uh, the name, the Australian Conservatives and National Party have objected and that's held up uh, getting it uh, registered. Uh, normally if you're a sitting senator, registration of a political party is automatic, but that's been held up. Now he's had meetings in... Uh, Queensland and New South Wales and he was planning to come down anyway for the the Melbourne meeting and it was just a coincidence that this massacre happened on the on the Friday but the meeting went ahead uh, as planned was to, uh, attended by the the local uh, Melbourne uh, Patriot scene people such as uh, Neil Erickson, Blair Cottrell and uh, Ricky Turner were there and then when uh, Fraser Anning was was giving a, a press conference uh, to, uh, to the media, a, a boy uh, behind him who is who has now been identified as Will Conley smacked a Ed egg on the back of his head, and Fraser Anning reacted by slapping him twice. Uh, bef and uh, both men were restrained uh, before uh, anything further could happen. And a group of the Patriots made sure that they restrained. Uh, uh, the boy uh, Will Conley and tour police they took because I watched this live because the Unshackled was live streaming it. A lot of our, wow. uh, a lot of the 
the footage has been used by other international uh, news organisations. The police mm. seems to take forever to arrive. I couldn't believe that, that they were not actually in there when the meeting was taking place, given the hostile environment that had engulfed the, the senator for the past 24 hours. I was thinking... Yeah. And, and now there's calls for... Like the the boy was released without charge, but now there's calls to charge Senator Anning with a with assault and those who restrained him with using excessive force. Well, I mean, really, um, when you look at the footage, as uh, soon as the egg hit his head, he slapped him. Then the boy seemed to have a bit of a reaction and 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 sort of um, then you know threw a bit of a, a punch himself, and then he and then Senator Anning then you know went for him again, and then that's when it got broken up. So really, when you look at what what had happened, I wouldn't say that there was excessive force. I would say that you know it was legitimate. I mean, you got to you got to understand that. I mean, an egg to the back of the head. I mean, that that's something that you know, most people would consider disgusting and, and, and something that um, would have somewhat hurt. I mean, you know... If, yeah, if I've was, seen if, plenty uh, of people excuse it, saying, yeah. oh, it was a form of ci civil disobedience or people uh, do it for a, for a prank. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you'd love it. No, no, you can you can really get sore from it. I mean, you can get whiplash in the neck. From that, and, and he didn't know that it was an egg. He could have thought it might have been that's acid right. or something. Well, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that's why when you look at the things, I mean, I think it was legitimate what he did as a reaction. I mean, he didn't really go into him and just full on, you know, beat him up to, to, to a pulp. I mean, he, you know, just used um, what I would consider reasonable force. And I mean, you got to also understand not only that he could have gotten hurt by this, but um, also the fact, like you mentioned, that um, he wasn't aware of what it was. And that's what prompted the, you know, anyone in that position would have done the same thing. I mean, you know, you, you just... You know, it, it's it's a reaction that, that is, you know, any person would do. And I think a lot of people have come out and supported him. I mean, obviously you have a lot of people, you know, um, supporting Egg Boy as well, which I think is disgusting. I mean, you know, he ended up starting this, yet they're, you know, branding him a hero. And when you have senators or politicians coming out and actually praising Egg Boy, uh, like Sarah Hanson Young and uh, a few others have, I mean, why aren't they put on the spotlight now and called extreme? Yeah, because, even I mean, Scott they're... Morrison, he didn't yeah. condemn Egg Boy. He said that Senator Anning should face the full force of the law. So basically, Sarah Hansen Young and Scott Morrison, uh, given that logic, have basically said it's okay to assault politicians with, with eggs. Well, that's right. And I mean, I would like to see um, Scott Morrison get an egg to his head and see if he feels the same way when it, when it happens to him. I mean, someone actually mentioned that on social media. They actually said, well, now that I know that um, people like Scott Morrison, Sarah Hanson Young, um, you know, that, that we are free to, to egg people, now, now I might consider doing it myself. You know, <laughs> obviously, if it was to happen to them, I mean, I'm sure that they're going to get in trouble for it. So yeah. it just depends on the person, isn't it? <laughs> uh, David Linehaum, because he's been defending gun laws today, he's had 10 threats of egging on, on social media saying, you're the, you're the next to be egged. But this boy, he's 17 years old, he goes to high school. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't schools, don't you get suspended if you egg people? Uh, like what sort of message is like he he go he he's going to be back at school on on Monday. I mean, is he's he he's basically going to be celebrated for something you get suspended for? That well, that that's right. I mean, this this is this is what they call activism. <laughs> you know, it's activism when you know you have people on the left doing these things. You know, and I mean, they 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 have no rules whatsoever. I mean, you know, they can walk naked on the streets during Mardi Gras. They can, you know, be violent against people whenever they choose to. As soon as someone with nationalist views comes out, no, they have to clamp down and shut him off. You know, you have to basically, you know, do whatever you do to take him down. Anyone that uses any force against them is legitimately um, uh, uh, able to. You know, the whole uh, punch a Nazi sort of rhetoric. I well, mean, it's now egg a Nazi. Yeah. That that was trending on Nazi. Twitter last yeah. night. Yeah, and I mean, how how can these people that are supposed to be peace loving, you know, hippies or you know whatever they call themselves, how how can they? be hypocritical when it comes to this like i mean aren't they supposed to be against violence aren't they supposed to be you know passive people yet um it depends on who you are um doing it to and a lot of you know i i know i've seen a lot of what, what people that call themselves uh, less libertarians um and they come out and say oh yeah but because his ideology is um aggressive that somehow it's okay to be able yeah, to yeah. them. i mean i don't understand that i mean you know i thought that 
um, you know, it starts with you really, doesn't it? I mean, just because someone's ideology might be um, contradicting yours and you might call it, consider it um, aggressive or whatnot. I mean, if he hasn't done anything to you, why do you have a right to go over there and actually be violent towards him? I just don't understand that. And there's been a fundraiser set up for Egg Boy, which has got $30,000 for legal fees. Uh, uh, who, who knows what, what some ambulance chaser lawyer uh -huh. is planning. And he's, and he's got over 300,000 Instagram followers now. Uh, going back to Anning himself, there's now a petition which has been signed by a million people. We don't know how many of those are actually... Uh, Australian on change.org to have him booted from Parliament, which you can't actually do. You, you can't expel so somebody from Parliament, otherwise it, it would just be abused by the, the governing parties. I mean, Anning's up for re-election in just a couple of months, so uh, the, the voters will, will decide there. You can't just, you know... <laughs> Uh, so, so, uh, click a <laughs> click a button and someone's booted. Uh, but uh, it's uh, Scott Morrison has said uh, uh, that uh, the Senate leaders Matthias Coleman and Penny Wong are working on a bipartisan censure uh, motion. So they're they're, they're they're going to make uh, life as unpleasant for him as possible when Parliament resumes. Yeah, of course they would, wouldn't they? I mean, you know, it just shows where the Labor and Liberal. Uh, which, which really is the coalition, the major party coalition is. I mean, um, people uh, with what you would say, uh, you know, nationalist views, libertarian views. Um, uh, I mean, even though it seems like our ideology is very widespread within the community, it is basically, um, at least when it comes to representation in parliament, uh, such a minority, a very, very small minority. And not only is that unfair because obviously you know we aren't getting representation uh, considering how many people of us believe in that sort of uh, principles but also um it, it means that uh they are treating us like we are some sort of fringe uh some sort of fringe groups that um have no sway and that basically you know that we're extremists even though there is so much support out there i mean when you have um, Anning that has, you were mentioning, 104,000 uh, followers. I mean, that is a big following. 104,000 followers. I mean, that's huge. So how can somebody say that um, he is somewhat some sort of extremist fringe person here? I mean, I just don't buy it. And on the way out from Melbourne, he was harassed by some uh, Muslims when he was uh, checking mm. through uh, security. Mm. And I just wonder where... Like, given what had just happened at the the meeting, the political party meeting, uh, he there was no police protection around him at all. They were just free to harass him, and uh, and Fraser Anning, he wasn't uh, violent or aggressive towards them because, uh, thankfully, uh, the Muslims they just abused him. They didn't touch him, which is what mm. we want to see. We want to see. Uh, people attack each other with words. That's how we how we deal with with things. So I guess there was some yep. progress on on that front. But uh, would other politicians be be happy with that lax security around them? Well, I mean, it definitely has to be you know brought into question here. I think I think this is what people don't understand here. Um, a lot of politicians, if not most majority politicians, there would despise him and despise his views. But at the same time, they have to look at things uh, with unbiased eyes here. I mean, this guy here has uh, walked through an airport without any security and has been um, harassed by um, a couple of guys. Now, what if um, these couple of guys were um, like the guy in New Zealand? You know what I mean? Like, this, this is what I mean here. Like, I mean, no politician is safe. If they, if they, you know, shrug this off as, oh, yeah, who cares? He gets what he deserves. But someone could say the same thing to you. I mean, yeah. if you have anybody that opposes your thing. ideology. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he deserved what he got too, right? I mean, this is what I mean. And I mean, you have to be consistent in, in your, your principles here. I mean, if you are not a violent person, you shouldn't wish violence on anybody. 
And because Anning is such a evil fascist Nazi politician, are we being told by the conservative hacks on TV, this is why you should never vote for a minor party, or he was elected as a, a one nation uh, senator, so this is a consequence of voting for those dangerous minor, minor parties and you should vote for the, the sensible uh, major uh, parties with all of their enlightened politicians. Yeah, but the thing is, the major parties have failed people. You know, I mean, we, we, we've given enough, we've given the major parties enough time to um, make us feel like we're, um, you know, in a society that we're, you know, striving economically, that we are safe, that, um, you know, things are going well, but they're failed. You know, if, why would people be voting for something else if what was happening at the moment was ideal? Um, this is why people are seeking something different because the major parties um, aren't offering anything um, that is considered to be uh, positive, to be uh, contributing to bettering our lives, you know? I mean, it's, um, you know, they, they, they're wasting our money, they're, uh, you know, continuously, you know, mass immigration, making our streets unsafe, they're, um, you know, social progressive policies that are really, you know, adding to, you know, more insanity, you know, safe schools and all the rest of it. There's, there's so much, you know, stuff happening out there. And people are saying, this is just insane. We need a change here. So, I mean, for the major parties to come out and, you know, point to someone like Anning, which is um, basically, you know, someone that would pass a pub test, you know what I mean? Like, these are the kind of people that, um, you know, have the same sort of views as the average guy on the street whether people like to admit it or not, you know? I mean, yes, they don't have the views of people that live within, you know, five, ten kilometres from a city, um, inner city, CBD, the latte sippers and stuff. But um, most people, you know, on general, um, agree with a lot of his views and um, have some sort of um, sympathy for them. And until the major parties reconnect with your average person and not this elite, um, you know, intellectual mob from the cities which are only a minority of people, um, then, you know, people are going to continue to vote for minor parties and, and their votes are going to continue to rise. Well, I think it's fair to say this week we've seen pretty much the end of the, the right wing in Australia. I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty much dead on every level. And what we were originally going to talk about uh, before uh, the, the massacre in Christchurch happened was well, some other right-wing fails. Uh, uh, this week in Australian politics was dominated by the, the National Party trying to have some sort of uh, rebellion on energy policy to get a new uh, government-funded coal-fired power mm -hmm. project up. But of course, what is happening is that inner city liberals who are uh, under attack from uh, liberal independents and, and Greens is mm. on climate change and they're like, no, no, we've got to talk up our climate uh, change uh, fighting credentials and Scott Morrison's mm. has his climate solutions policy. So they don't know where they they are on energy policy. They don't even have a, a energy policy and it's just a complete mess. Well, this is exactly what I was saying before they are focusing on one uh, particular um, minority of Australians which live in the CBDs that um, hold these um, you know, views on climate change and whatnot. And they are basically saying that these people are important than people that live out of the bush or you know, live in regional communities. So what makes them more important than other people? I mean, really when you look at things, I mean, if you want to be strategic here, um, the amount of inner city seats is very small. I mean, in each state, you might have a couple of seats that you would call inner city, you know, with um, this sort of, you know, latte sort of, you know, really left-wing progressive, you know, a couple of seats that you would call, you know, very high green sort of vote turnout uh, particular um, seats. So why would you try and appease uh, these kind of seats here uh, in which people know where they stand and aren't going to like you anymore if you try and, you know, because if you, if you try and go green, they're just going to vote for the real greens. They're not going to vote for fake greens. Well, you even know? Tony so, Abbott's trying to go green in his <laughs> uh, seat now, saying he supports yeah. uh, Paris now because he's concerned about losing his seat to Zali Stegall. 
but this is the thing, like, I mean, Abbott doesn't have to say that. If anything, people are going to be driven away from voting for him now and say, well, he's a sellout, you know? I mean, this is where they don't understand that they can't start appeasing. If you're being non... If you're not being authentic, people see through it and they're not going to support you. You know what I mean? Like, people have to look at you and say, okay, this piece, this person, whether we like him or hate him, we know where he stands. A beautiful quote from John Howard, right? And that's why he kept getting voted in because he was principled. Whether you liked him or hated him, you knew who he was. But people of today continue to try and be something they're not, right? And this is the problem. I mean, all the seats that are in regional areas, and there's a lot more in regional areas than the, in the city, in the CB, inner city CBDs, and people are getting turned off by this. I mean, the nationals are losing to the shooters, fishers and farmers. They have lost by-elections to independents and to SFF, and they're going to lose more. I mean, I can name a few seats in New South Wales that they're going to lose, for sure. I mean, but Barilaro is on edge, man. I mean, Barilaro has only got a 2.5% in his seat of Monaro, and he's the national leader in New South Wales, and he's a pretty much a goner from how I see things. I mean... You know, yeah, like, well, New South Wales uh, Nationals left us turn. I mean, that probably explains yeah. quite a bit. I mean, people people have to understand that when you don't mis when you don't represent, and Bar Barnaby actually made a really good point here. You have to represent your electorate. I mean, the Nationals have to stop listening to what the Liberals are doing. Let the Liberals, you know, represent their people, but the Nationals have to represent their constituents you do not start to turn because there's a couple of seats in the city that you know the liberals are getting edgy about i mean it's got nothing to do with that i mean this creates jobs there's a lot of unemployment over in the country areas they need projects that create jobs i mean how can you be a party like the nationals and i mean the labor party is a good example of this you know as well within the last couple of decades you know originally a workers party and now they're all going green and you know you know, there's there's power power stations getting shut down. That's why um, uh, the member for Hunter actually he gets a lot of flack um, on this in question time all the time because they always say the Liberals always say you're supposed to be a Labor man. You're in a mining t mining area, yet you're always you know instead of uh, sticking by your your mining uh, your working class credentials, you're always going you know gravitating towards this green sort of ideology. And you know this has really hurt them, and that's why minor parties are starting to win seats and they will continue to win seats and i see mccormack losing his job come after new south wales election i think the nationals are going to do really poorly lose a lot of seats and mccormack's job's on the line and i think barnaby knows that and i think once it happens i think um he's going to be replaced another right-wing fail from the, the past week was uh when uh, the right attempted to take down the, the Greens' new star candidate in the, the inner Melbourne seat of Kuyong, uh, human rights lawyer Julian Burnside. Now, he was attacked by Liberal Senator Jane Hume on, on Sky News because he was a member of the Men's Only Savage uh, Club. And uh, sh uh, she said, how could you uh, be, a, be a member of this exclusionary club? And well, you actually got married there as well. And, and he tried to explain, <laughs> oh, but I've been trying to uh, let uh, wi uh, women in, uh, uh, trying to advocate for that, and she tried to interrupt, and then he was like, don't interrupt, and then this was on International Women's Day, yeah. <laughs> and then she said, oh, were you just interrupting a, a woman? And <laughs> it, it was attacking a leftist from the left, saying, you're not a real lefty, uh, we yeah. on the right, we're the, 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 the real the re lefties. Yeah, we're, we're, we're the real feminists. And what yeah. is, like, yeah, like, attack uh, Julian Birdside for being a hypocrite, but if he wants to be part of a men's only club, uh, that's that, that's his choice. I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with men's only organisations. Sometimes men want to be around with other men, just time women want to be with other women. I mean, there's the Country Women's Association, there's Fernwood Fitness, no one ever attacks the, the female-only clubs. No, 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 uh, but, no. you know, the, the Lad Society and the Proud Boys, or they get uh, attacked that uh, they have a, a men's only club, or they must be, you know, planning their, the, the patriarchal domination there. Uh, when I saw this video, it was the biggest cringe I've ever had, I think, for a long time. I, I could not believe it, like you mentioned. I mean, um, this is 
I've been discussing this with a few people when this actually happened, and I posted it on social media, and I said, this is the failure of modern-day conservatism. I mean, modern-day conservative, uh, rather than, you know, sticking by your principles and saying, oh, yeah, you know, you're part of a men's club, great, that's awesome, you know, um, we stand by that, you know, we support your rights, no problems. Um, you know, they're trying to catch this guy on a gotcha moment for purely political, you know, um, opportunism, and at the same time, they're playing the leftist game. And, and you know, when you, when you watch that video clip and you don't know who those people are, you would assume that the, the liberal lady um, in this was the, the green. You know what I mean? And this is hmm. what this is why we fail here. Because yeah, Jane Hume would, has a history of sort of yeah. a punching right. Well, well, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. Most of the, the women in the Liberal Party are like that. Um, <laughs> but um, so there's, there's nothing of surprise there. But the thing is... You would never, ever get a Green trying to do the same to someone in the Liberal Party or, you know, um, you know, Conservatives or whatever. You would never get a Green, try and get, your, uh, get a gotcha moment on them and say, oh, why is it that, um, you know, you're going soft on immigration? You're, you're, you're being hypocritical to your hard immigration stances. Why is it that you're going soft on abortion laws now? You should be, you know, consistent and be hard like you normally are and make sure that, you know, you're very much against, um, you know, legalising abortion. Do you know what I mean? Like, the yeah. Greens wouldn't do that. They're not stupid. I mean, because by doing that, it basically shifts the ball in their court and it basically makes um, things, you know, shift in their favour. I mean, the left doesn't do stupid stuff like this, but you always see it on the right, appeasement. You always see them, you know, playing their game and, you know, trying to catch them out on a moment and say, oh, you know, you're not the feminists, we're the real feminists. I mean, this is where conservatism has gone wrong. And that's why people are gravitating to a more uh, nationalistic sort of, you know, um, ideology, because conservatism has done very little to conserve anything within the last few decades. And it's gone downhill. I mean, they've gone too soft and on the defensive that the left have just been running things, running institutions, running, you know, politics for, you know, decades now. And the last major story of the week, and it was the, the reason why I originally invited you on the show, uh, that was the, the sentencing of Cardinal George Powell after he was convicted of historical child uh, sexual abuse. He was jailed for six years with a, a minimum of three years and eight months. Now, I had uh, Johnny Moore on the show uh, last week, who's a, a Catholic. He believed that uh, Cardinal Powell was guilty. Now, I know uh, you're a Catholic as well, Damien, but you uh, come at it from a, a different perspective. You believe that, that Cardinal Powell has been the victim of a witch hunt. Well, I actually um, watched a really good um, video that Andrew Bolt did um, as soon as he um, did this, um, as soon as he got charged. And um, I think he makes a lot of uh, points which when you look at things as to how they have taken place, you can't really say that they, he was proven beyond reasonable doubt. And this is what is scary now. I mean, a lot of, you know, people on the left and um, people that, you know, aren't fans of Christianity and stuff are very, you know, up in arms and saying, yeah, this is great, you know, you know, we've got him, we've got him. But they don't understand that this is going to, you know, this is really dangerous because if this was to happened to them one day and somebody was to accuse them without any real evidence they could be going to jail even though it hasn't happened i mean and we don't know if it's happened or not i mean no one knows but at the end of the day when you look at the facts here it wasn't proven by reasonable doubt there was no witnesses um you know there was a lot of inconsistencies such as ha having it happen after mass the sacristy issue where, you know, normally he wouldn't be there. And if he was, there would be a lot of people going in and out. The door being open, is, you know, I couldn't believe the judge said that because the door was open that he was, it was an arrogance thing. I mean, if he was really wanting to um, cover up something he was doing, he would have closed it. He wouldn't have left it open. Um, a lot of people have come out and said that they normally, at that time of uh, after mass, they're around Cardinal Pell and they wouldn't have let him out of his sights. Um, the, the, you know, the whole boys um, going into the sacristy to, to you know, um, drink the wine, I think, I think that's very, you know, something you'd read out of a, uh, a novel. It just seems really unreal. And um, the parting of the, the robes as well, which is, you know, not really easy to just part the robes to the side. It doesn't happen that way. I mean, you have to really, um, you know, t it, it takes a lot of effort to take the clothes off, you know. I mean, I, I just... 
I see a lot of inconsistencies here. And I think um, knowing that a lot of people disliked him for his conservative views, um, even a lot of liberal Catholics didn't like him because of that, um, there always was that element of um, a certain population that you know wanted him done. And this is very dangerous now, like I said, because if you are accused, just plain hearsay, someone coming up and say, yep, this happened you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, without any evidence at all, that's it, you're, you're done for. And I think that's wrong. I think that's really scary because it can happen to anyone. I mean, um, not even in regards to children. I mean, you're a guy and um, you know, you're at a party, you know, you're walking down the street, whatever. Someone or whatever, a, a woman comes forth, knows who you are, doesn't like you for whatever reason, goes to the authorities, say, he touched me, that's it, you're done. You know, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't be prosecuting people without solid evidence. And I think this really is something that people have to look past. It's not because it's Pell. This is something that happened to, it could have happened to anyone. And I think it's very dangerous for the system for something like this to happen. Well, like I said on the, the show with Johnny Moore, I hope that the jury has made the, the right decision. I don't want to see an innocent man uh, go to jail for any reason i mean my personal feelings about pal is is not so much he is his conservative views he's entitled to those to, just that he comes across as a very cold person he doesn't come across as very very caring but you can't throw people in jail for for that that's that's not how our system is uh, s supposed to work yeah i was just going to say he grew up in, in in the old days when things were like that people were more serious they're not as friendly and as you know soft as they are now i mean things were different back then where people were more sort of you know more serious more cold you know not necessarily meaning they're bad people just the mindset is different it's just the times that they grew up in you know i mean and um People also have to understand, look at what happened with Kavanaugh, you know, and look, look at how many cases that um, women, for instance, um, have come forth and said, you know, this happened and then later on, oh, yeah, you know, they lied about the whole thing. You know, this, this is why, why it has to be proven beyond reasonable doubt. I mean, if it isn't, then there, there is element to, you know, it not having taken place. And that is scary to send someone to jail like that. Yeah. We saw on Q and A this week, uh, Karen Andrews, one of the the government ministers, say that uh, men shouldn't mentor women anymore because there there could be an accusation of uh, sexual harassment or misconduct that could come up. Well, I think men are going to be starting to think that way for their own safety. I mean, it's uh, it's not so much that she's now saying that oh, you know, they they shouldn't be doing it or else. I mean, I think men are going to be very very careful. I mean, you're not going to have men want to have, you know, basically be around children. That's for one. Then there's not going to be guys that want to, um, you know, mentor women or be around them because that, who knows, you know? I mean, if you get on the on the wrong foot of somebody, all they have to do is, you know, say, you know what? I'm going to go to the authorities and say this. And at the end of the day, the man deep down knows that he's screwed even if he hasn't done anything. And I mean, this, even even if he's innocent and proven innocent in law, his reputation is damaged so much that it really will affect him. I mean, you know, and this is the scary thing in society right now. I mean, we're even getting people come out about Michael Jackson now and he's dead. He can't yeah. even defend himself and people yeah. are coming out against him. I mean, 10 years. You know, after after yeah, death, he, he was found not guilty. Uh, yeah. and there was a ten year yeah FBI investigation, but all of a sudden, because of uh, some one sided documentary, we've got to delete his music from history. That, 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 that's that's right, and I mean it's it's madness, and I mean a lot of people are seeing inconsistencies and and flaws within our courts and our law and our system. And, you know, how, how can you not? I mean, this is just madness. I mean, unless you have solid evidence, unless you have multiple witnesses, unless you have, um, you know, DNA, some sort of surveillance, something to prove that these things occurred, I mean, you can't come out decades after, not even just a year after, decades after, and all of a sudden say that this happened. I mean, people... A lot of people could be doing this, um, you know, especially when it happens to famous people. A lot of people do this um, for monetary reasons. Because, yeah, they, oh, yeah. He was, there were yeah. attempts to extort Michael Jackson many years back. 
Exactly. I mean, it's, he's had a very difficult upbringing. I mean, if you really look into the Michael Jackson story, it's really interesting. I've read books on it. You know, but at the end of the day, you know, even if you were to call him out and say the guy was weird, he was strange, you could say all those things. Okay, fair enough. I mean, he wasn't your average sort of guy. But was he someone that abused kids? I mean, that, that at the end of the day is where you have to really look at it. I mean, you can't just look at him and say, oh, yeah, this guy's a weirdo, so he's done it. I mean, you, you have to be fair here. Unless you've got the evidence to back things up, unless you really know that this has happened, then you can't just, based on, you know, because, you know, he looks like this or, you know, um, he acts this way, you can't just assume and make assumptions when it comes to law because a lot of innocent people have been, you know, sent to prison um, and then many years down the track, they get released and, and get proven that they never did the crime in the first place. I mean, you know, this is scary. It's very scary and people need to start calling it out, you know, and not just jumping on the media bandwagon because everyone's, you know, jumping on, oh, yeah, Pell's guilty, he's this, he's a molester. But there was no hard evidence. I mean, how can you make an assumption like that? I'm not saying 100% he's innocent or guilty, but what I'm saying is that there is a lot of inconsistencies and until he's proven 100% with solid evidence guilty, I'm not going to believe it. Well, we'll see uh, what the appeal decides. That's in June, so it's a while away. But for the moment, uh, Cardinal Powell is, is behind bars. But we've, we've summarised the, the week as, as much as we can. Uh, this has been a very long episode, but obviously uh, Christchurch, what happened there, uh, took up so much of the uh, news uh, cycle and has been dominating the news this weekend. But we still wanted to discuss uh, what we were originally uh, going to plan. So thanks, Damien, for, for coming on again and sharing your perspective. And yeah, uh, look forward to uh, your further analysis in the, the New South Wales election. So thanks for having me, Tim. And that's the show for today. Now, even though the Christchurch horror has been the topic of the news this past weekend, the voters of New South Wales still go to the polls on Saturday the 23rd of March, so we'll be doing another Unshackled Election Night live stream beginning at 6pm on Facebook and YouTube Live, and we'll feature a variety of New South Wales-based alt-media personalities. It will be on throughout the night, offering our own alternative analysis of the results as they come in, both in the live lower and upper house. It is tipped to be one of the closest elections in living memory, so it is a night that you will not want to miss. Now, as I mentioned in the show, Milo's visa has been denied again, so the Deplorables tour looks extremely doubtful, as Tommy Robinson and Gavin McGuinness will probably not be granted a visa on the same grounds. They are facing their own court battles back home, with Tommy facing his retrial for contempt of court, his uh, court action uh, attempting to bring uh, action against the uh, police that got thrown out, and also Gavin McGuinness is in the process of suing the Southern Poverty Law Centre for defamation. Now, it's probably doubtful that we'll see any more speaking tours from prominent right-wing people uh, for a very long time. Let's hope that there is still uh, one conversation we can have, that is the Conversation About Feminism Tour featuring bad feminist Roxane Gay and factual feminist Christina Hoff Summers, which we hope we can still have constructively. Uh, you can go to thisis42.com slash feminist for more information and to buy tickets. Now, it is during events such as these that the Unshackled's popularity surges, which is always uh, very pleasing. However, it also makes us prime for attack by our enemies, with calls for us to be deplatformed and censored. So it's important that you support our work financially uh, during this time, so we can continue to cut through the fake news from the mainstream media. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash the Unshackled, and directly via our PayPal link, paypal.me slash the Unshackled, and we also have our premium membership option, which is at theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. And thank you to all our new financial supporters over the past few days. So thanks once again for your company and stay safe. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.